So let's get my little presentation up. So I'm calling this uh, Biophysical Economics and the Coronavirus Pandemic. So these are just some thoughts that I uh, came up with over the last few days. Basically, I'm going to tell you about my research, but I'm going to frame it in a way that hopefully is rele relevant to our, um, our current situation. Uh, so the way I see, uh, see things right now, we're dealing with constraints, and there are two of them as we deal with the pandemic. There are monetary constraints and there are biophysical constraints. And the monetary constraints get almost all of the attention, and rightly so, because um, they're important. But I want to highlight a different type of constraint that you maybe haven't thought about, and it has to do with the way our economy is structured. Um, so let's talk briefly about the monetary constraints, and you're all thinking about them anyway. Basically, we can say this very short, uh, succinctly, how do I pay my rent? If I'm not working, how do I pay my rent? How do I buy food? How do I support my family? And I'll use myself as an example, but it will hold true for millions of people around the world. So I'm, I'm an academic, but what I get paid to do right now is to teach high school. I'm a, a substitute teacher. And so right now here, as in most places, the schools are canceled. So the government was nice enough to pay me for a few weeks, but then they decided, no, we're not going to do that. So I'm not getting paid to be a high school teacher. And uh, so then what do I do? How do I make money? And this is what millions of people around the world are thinking about. They don't have an income suddenly, and they, but they still need to eat. They still need to... Uh, pay rent. So how do we um, finance these things? So this is really a question of finance. It's a monetary constraint. And to just kind of put some numbers on this, here's a graph from Canada, but it would be true for probably any country with a big welfare system. This is on the on the horizontal axis here. Can you guys see my mouse, by the way? Okay. On the horizontal axis, we've j it's just time. This is the last 70 years in Canada. And what we're looking at here is employment insurance claims. And it was more or less constant for 100 years with some seasonal ups and downs. And then we get here to 2020 and this huge jump up to a million people. And in Canada, a million people is a lot. Like there's only 35 million people in Canada. So that's, that's a huge number of people. And I think the same thing would be true in the U.S. Tens of millions of people. And basically what this means is people who were financed by the private sector are now being financed their income is being financed by the government and of course this always raises the issue of constraints on government spending uh, inevitably and so here's again I'm focusing on Canada but uh, this would be the same in the US basically the government is uh, using debt to finance uh, this spending so the government the US government has uh, just passed a bill that's what two trillion maybe more than that dollars and in Canada something similar but smaller because it's a smaller country and this is financed with debt and economists um, traditional or neoclassical economists will say that this is a problem and I'm not going to dwell on this but this is something that you should be aware of that there's a whole branch of theory devoted to government spending and the creation of money and it's called modern monetary theory uh, or MMT for short and I've got some links here these are clickable so I'll, I'll share my slides with Brian after and uh, you guys can click on these links here if you want to explore but I'll just give you a brief synopsis of what modern monetary theory is and it's basically about a misunderstanding so traditionally economists think of governments just like households they're just a, a large household uh, and as a household there are legitimate financial constraints so if I lose my job um, or if I need money I'm gonna borrow it and I'm gonna pay interest on whatever I uh, whatever loan I get and I also have to pay back the principal so a debt is an obligation to be repaid 
And the thinking goes that the same is true for government. If governments um, don't earn enough from taxes, well, they have to borrow money, supposedly, I guess, from citizens, and pay that back in the future with interest. And, and the thinking is it's exactly like a household. And the claim that I think is made correctly by moni modern monetary theory is that this is a basic misunderstanding that governments aren't households for the simple reason that they can create money at will. I can't, a government can. The US government controls its own currency, the US dollar, and it can create it at will. It can create it with debt if it wants to, or it can create it without debt. Money, uh, so money is basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a fiction that we all agree to um, abide by and the government basically has control over this so there are absolutely no financial constraints on government spending there are many other types of constraints so I'm going to talk about some biophysical constraints but a financial c constraint is a, um, not one of them the government can create as much money as it wants and finance uh, the incomes of the whole population if it needs to so that's something to be aware of that is a, an immediate um, problem that the, we're all dealing with is how do we get paid as we as many of us sit at home and are not working at our usual jobs but that's not what I want to oh uh, got ahead of myself so how should we think of a monetary constraint a financial constraint well it's a social constraint money is power um, and so when we talk about finance we're talking about who gets to create money and who gets to spend it and usually, in most uh, market societies, we leave that up to the private sector. We leave it up to banks. We leave it up to the financial sector to create money and inject it into the economy. But government uh, can do that just as well, if not better. So this is a question about who gets to have power. Um, and it's an important question, and, and if you're interested, we can discuss it. But I want to, for the meat of my talk, discuss some biophysical constraints um, on how we deal with this pandemic. And so when I mean biophysical, I mean how is the economy structured physically and demographically. So before we get into it, um, mostly we're going to be talking about how our society has changed um, through industrialization. And think about industrialization basically as a biophysical transformation that's just that's a bunch of big words but basically the structure of the economy changes and I'm gonna in many ways I'm gonna highlight just two of them and uh, uh, talk about how they're relevant for our situation right now so let's start with one change that's uh, obviously bad for pandemics any type of pandemic and that's urbanization um, Here's a city. I'm not sure what city it is, but the city it is. But the point is that people are packed together, and if you want to physically distance yourself from other people, it's very difficult in a city. So I live in a city. I live in in Toronto. Um, most of you probably live in cities, and the next graph is going to tell you why that is or how that came to be, at least. So this is a chart of the urban and rural population in the US. So over time, uh, on the bottom here we have time, starting in uh, 1790 going up to 2010. And here on the vertical axis we have the portion of uh, people uh, in each sector, or not sector, but in urban and rural settings. So blue here is urban. So going back to 1790, just after the US was formed basically about 8% give or take of the population was urb urban and the vast majority 90 95% were rural and over time that has basically flipped so now about 80% people live in cities and 10% 20% are rural so how does that affect um, pandemics well it means we're closer together and and so these diseases can spread and and historically going like back 
before we knew anything about infectious diseases, cities were um, bastions of disease. Like the um, people in cities usually had lower um, life expectancies, and they were bas basically demographic. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sinks. People would constantly move in from the countryside and fill in the po urban population that you know didn't survive very well. But anyway, now we have sanitation, but we still have this problem of living close together. And so that's the kind of pandemic side of it. And let's talk about the biophysical aspect of this. How did we go, how did we transform ourselves from an, an, a rural species, a farming species, to an urban species? And the answer basically is energy. It takes energy to support people in cities. And if you think about this, this is not hard to understand. Uh, cities don't grow their own food. They don't make their own stuff. All of the stuff that you use inside a city has to be brought in from the countryside. And that takes energy not only to bring it in, but it takes energy for those people who are out there in the country uh, making that stuff. For them to be productive enough to support you in a city takes a lot of energy. You need tractors, you need all kinds of machinery, and it takes energy to make that stuff and run it. So let's talk about this urbanization and energy use relation. So this is, excuse me, international data. So each dot here is a country. What you're looking at here is energy use on the bottom. Use Energy use per capita, energy use per person, and it's a log scale, by the way. So each uh, each big tick mark is a factor of 10. And this is the urban population, a percentage of people uh, living in cities, basically. So low energy countries like Eritrea and Bangladesh um, have very few people in cities, 20%, give or take. And as you ramp up energy use, getting up here to the US, Iceland, Qatar, who uh, use a lot of energy, you have a lot of people. Almost, in, for instance, in Qatar, almost 100% of the population is in cities. And that takes a lot of energy use. So the trend is what is important. Now, um, this is important for many things. It's important for climate change. So if we kind of um, step back and look at some bigger uh, long-term issues, climate change is the big one. How do you deal with climate change in an urban population? Well, if we want to reduce our emissions, we can't, it's, it's almost a foregone conclusion that we need to use less energy. And does that mean we need to de-urbanize? So that's a big question that, um, that we need to, to think about. And we can discuss that, but uh, for now I will move on. Now let's talk about a change that is good for... Um, mitigating pandemics. And that's the service transition. Um, so you probably want to know what the service transition is and why it's relevant, so let's talk about that. So first of all, let's talk about how this relates to industrialization. And I'm going to dispel some myths for you. Uh, the standard thinking is that industrialization means the growth of industry. Uh, and industry are, is, is things like construction, manufacturing, uh, and mining. Uh, but the reality is that industrialization is really the growth of the service sector. And I'm going to show you how that's happened. So here is a demographic uh, pyramid in the US at two points in time. So this is what the US looked like in 1800, 220 years ago, and this is what it looks like in 2010. So what you're looking at here is the size of each sector. So green is agriculture. So in 1800, about 80 percent of the US population lived or worked in agriculture. They were farmers. And another 10% were in uh, industry, and another 10% were in the service sector. Fast forward 
to 200, uh, 2010 and everything is flipped. So now you have maybe 5%, no more than 5% of the population uh, working as farmers, still about 20%, 15, 20% working in industry, and then you have this huge service sector. 80% of the population are working in services. Uh, okay. Uh, well, the quick answer is that the service sector is everything that's not farming and everything that's not industry. So that includes a lot of stuff. Uh, that, that would include transportation. It includes government. It includes um, um, health care. Um, what else? Retail. So it's not just things that you would if somebody says service sector job you think oh uh, you work at a restaurant or you work at uh, retail well in this context it's um it's much broader than that it's everything that's not literally making goods or making food i don't know does that clarify it hopefully okay no well uh, so this is a question that I don't make the definitions. The national counts make the definitions. Um, uh, so software would be the service sector. Intel would be manufacturing, which would be industry. So economy, the people in the national accounts make these d divisions b b between uh, whether they think somebody makes an actual physical good or not. Now it's all very complicated and in some cases very arbitrary. So we don't need to dwell on the specifics so much as the, kind of the big trend. Uh, and I'm going to show you the, the time series trend in the next slide. Uh, so this is what the, the transition has looked like over time. Uh, so this is 220 years of history. Going back to 1800 again, 80% of the population is farmers, and another 20%, 10% are services, 10% in industry. So what's important here is two big trends. Agriculture declines, and the service sector grows. And those are the two constants. Now, for the first half of the Industrial Revolution, the industry also grew. Uh, but that's not true for the whole period. So in the first half of the 20th century, it was mostly constant. And then we have this period after 1970 where the number of people working in industry just collapsed. And this has a lot to do with trade, the effects of trade. Um, and I don't want to get into that too much, but basically a lot of the um, industrial jobs that the U.S. did do in the 1950s are now done in China. So this is an effect of of being in a global economy. So you can't look at one country as a kind of an island. But still, I, I don't have the graph for it, but this same kind of trend um, is true for the whole world. Uh, so the service sector is growing and agriculture is declining, and then industry is staying uh, more or less the same. Um, but we don't have the problem with the, the global stuff is we don't have data going back 200 years. The U.S. always has the best data, so that's why I'm, uh, we're looking at just the U.S. here. Um, now, how is this made possible? And again, the answer is energy. Uh, you need energy to make people or allow people to work in the services. And again, this is because uh, people in the service sector don't make stuff. And I'll use myself as an example. I have never made a single piece of the goods or, or food that I have consumed in my lifetime. Somebody else has made that. And yet I, you know, con compared to the average human being throughout history, I consume a massive amount of stuff, none of which I made. So other people need to make that stuff for me. And uh, there are fewer of those people than ever before. So how do they produce that much stuff? Well, the answer is energy. Uh, farmers and people in, in industry use a massive amount of energy to get that 
to make stuff. Basically, machines are doing all the work. They're burning fossil fuels and they're making our stuff. And then we're free to do all this service sector activity. And, and it's important to do this service sector stuff. But let's look at the energy transition. So here's a bit of a complicated graph, but I'll try to explain it. So on the bottom here, we have energy. And I know it says useful work, but I don't want to get into the distinction here. Just think of that as a type of energy, energy use per person on the horizontal axis here. And on the vertical axis, we have the portion of people working in each sector. So as energy, as energy use has increased, agriculture declines. So we're starting here in 1920 and going to 2000. And as this uh, energy use increases, the service sector grows. And then industry just kind of wobbles around. Nothing really happens. So this, on a side note here, a lot of people when they're talking about sustainability will say, well, we need to have a service transition. So, uh, if we transition to services, that will reduce our uh, material demand and that will make us more sustainable. But that's actually really misguided because we've had a service transition for 200 years and the only thing it's done is increased our energy use. So there's no reason to think that that trend is going to reverse. So that's the U.S. Same thing is true for uh, all the countries of the world. So now we're going we're gonna to look at international data. So each dot here is a country. And this, this is agriculture. So you're looking at here or on the horizontal axis, um, national energy use per capita. And on the vertical axis, um, uh, the size of agriculture. So here's uh, the size of the agricultural sector. So here's Cambodia, almost 100% of the, pop, the Cambodian population are farmers and they use a tiny, tiny amount of energy. Down here is the United States, uses a lot of energy and according to this graph, 2% of the population are farmers. And then so how does um, uh, energy use relate to the size of the industrial sector? Well, there's no clear trend. I know I've drawn, I've drawn in this, uh, this is actually a parabola, but it's not a very good fit. Basically, you have a blob of data here with no trend. So industrialization means more energy use, but it doesn't necessarily mean a larger uh, industrial sector, paradoxically. But it does mean a larger service sector. So here again, we have energy on the horizontal axis. So moving mo using more energy is moving to the right. So here's Cambodia again, uses virtually very little energy uh, and tiny service sector, 20% of all employment. And then moving up, here we have Canada where I am and here's Iceland. Iceland uses a huge amount of energy and again, very large service sector, 80, 70, 80, 90% of the population in services. So let's bring this back to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. I think this transition, this service transition, is helping us. And it's helping us undo some of the bad, the bad effects of urbanization. So we're basically running an experiment, um, an involuntary experiment, which is basically asking this question. How many jobs can our society do without in the short term, in the short run, for half a year maybe? Um, and we really don't know. We're going to find out. But I think the answer is an awful lot of jobs. Um, now, just to kind of put this in perspective, apparently um, half of humanity is now under lockdown, which means you're not supposed to leave your house. And I, the question that I'm asking is, would this have been possible 200 years ago? Would it have been possible to say to half the population, stay at home, don't work, we're going to ride this out? And I think the answer is no. And, and again, it has to do with this, um, this transition. Just for argument's sake, let's say that aside for, say, um, the government and uh, health care, we just get rid of the service sector. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. I can't go to my dentist and I can't uh, get a haircut, but we can live without it in the short term. Meanwhile, all these people in, in manufacturing and, and um, 
agriculture continue to work and supply us with more or less the goods we need with some shortages. So it's feasible and we'll see how it plays out over the next year. But we're basically trying this experiment. Would that have been possible um, 200 years ago? And I think the answer is no. You can't, if 80% of the population is in agriculture, you can't tell them to stop working because they're basically subsistence farmers. And if they stop working, they die and everybody else they support dies. Uh, now, granted, if you're on a farm, you're far away from other people, so maybe you can continue to work while you um, uh, stay away from other people. And so this is a, a complicated question. But basically, we live in cities now, which makes it harder for us to stay away from each other. But this demographic transition to services potentially means that many of us can just not work for maybe a year or half a year and uh, society will be just fine. So these are real constraints on our ability to deal with the uh, coronavirus pandemic. They have nothing, they are related to finance because finance affects things, um, but they're not financial constraints. These are biophysical constraints. So those are my thoughts. Thank you for uh, letting me join you guys. If you're interested, I have a, a blog about my research at uh, economics from the top down and I've the link is here. So and again, I'll share these slides with Brian. So these can go up. I imagine you have a course page. So uh, looking forward to the discussion.